quite a teenage band, really, and I can kind of understand why like teenagers kind of got it because it's that kind of music. It's it's kind of angsty. That music only comes out from you know an 18 or a 17 year old, really. friend decided we were going to start a band when we were like 15. We had like a, a youth centre bit to our school. There's a PA system there you could borrow and amps and stuff. So I took my keyboard with me. And um, Neil set all the equipment up. He was just there. He was outside, I think, playing golf in the field or something. I was up at the school practising golf. <laughs> I was a sad kid. And I heard this music coming from the youth wing and I just sort of wandered over and, and I ended up like s sticking around and playing guitar for them. We didn't speak about it. He just kept turning up and kept playing and I kept turning up and kept playing. Then that's how it started really. We were probably the only people at school that were both into the Smiths, so I think that was probably the point we connected, because Rachel at that point was just kind of into her goth phase. I was a heavy goth by that point. Neil was a total indie kid. So, yeah, it was quite a strange marriage in a musical sense, I suppose, because we were completely different, you know, but... And then we had common ground in bands like Velvet Underground. She wants to know, she wants to know. Rachel and I had been friends since we were five, and I guess when we were 17 or 18, we, we went out with each other for a while. Rachel and Neil always had bands through school, and they happened to be looking for a bass player, and I'd been a lonely bass player up to that point. We just sort of fitted in pretty well. I was having a slightly gothy phase at the time, and Rachel was a big Susie and the Banshees fan, and so, you know, I kind of got on with her immediately. Neil was a little bit cool about the fact that there were two goths in his indie band, but, you know, he soon got over that. There were some good promoters in Reading who were really proactive and put on, you know, some decent bands in quite a limited sort of environment. There was a really good club called The After Dark in Reading. And the promoter had managed, like, over about a year and a half. He had, like, Luke played there, Spaceman 3 played there, The Valentines played there. And so that it was a really influential period for us because we got to see all these bands play live. I was in a couple of rubbishy sort of bands at the time, and I'd go to my bloody Valentine gigs and I'd like study what Kevin was playing and go home and play the same chords. And it was like, this, what's going on? It sounds horrible. And I was good friends with Stephen from Chapter House, and he said, oh, they're using guitar tunings. So that just opened it out for me. So, you know, you had that noise stuff and then the tunings, and I was obsessed, yeah. After Christian joined, we'd just end up coming to rehearsals with more pedals and, you know, just experimenting a bit. And I think that was an important period for the band because I think our sound 
changed pretty radically from sounding sort of like the primitives or something to something with with a much sort of bigger guitar sound. The turning point for me, I remember, was the evening before we recorded our demo, which actually became our first EP. Neil started playing like a couple of chords, which became Avalyn, and uh, Nick came up with this bass line. And yeah, I think I just put the reverb on it on like as high as it could go. Suddenly we had a whole load of space. I think Avalyn was the point where we were, we felt, okay, so this, this is something that doesn't just sound like My Buddy Valentine or, or the Cocteau Twins, you know, it has its own thing happening. And that, that was a big moment, I think, for us as a band. That was the point when we started to sound like Slow Dive. finished that demo and we were supporting 5.30 at the After Dark Club. And there was an A&R guy there for them, really, and he saw us open for them and thought, you know what, I know someone who might be interested in hearing this band. And um, like a week later, we had a phone call from, from this Scottish guy claiming to be Alan McGee. Alan McGee, by the way, was the gentleman who brought um, Jesus and Mary Chain to, um, to fruition in this world. And the chief executive officer of um, Creation Records. Creation were like the label. They, they were basically the coolest label in the country. They had all these bands like Primal Scream, House of Love, My Bloody Valentine, you know, all of our kind of favorite bands. And I think Ride had just come along as well, who we really liked. <laughs> Having made a name for himself as a successful talent scout, McGee gets dozens of cassettes every day, and in amongst them has found the future stars of his label. Yeah, he literally just phoned up out of the blue one day. You know, I was living in a house with Rachel in Reading, and I answered the phone, it was just like, McGee's on the phone, and I'm just like, he's on the phone. I think Neil phoned me at home and said, we're, we're going to meet Alan McGee in the ship hotel in Reading. And I was just like, yeah, whatever, whatever, mate. And yeah, it was, it was bizarre just walking in and seeing this guy with curly ginger hair and sunglasses sat on a table in the corner of a bar in Reading. And I remember we were all really, really quiet because we were so in awe of Alan. I don't think I said a word to him the whole time. They all sat in a little kind of semicircle and I sat there and I just spoke at them. And they were like little kids, you know when they were like 16 and they really have got zero confidence but they're fronting it out and they were like just kind of giggling amongst themselves. Right on the spot he said, I want to sign you guys. I think, he's, I think his exact words were, I think you're fucking ethereal. We, we pretty much agreed on the spot <laughs> in the time-honoured tradition of not thinking about things when you're, like, 19 years old. I looked out the window after we, they went away and they'd got signed. And you know how the little kids jump on each other in the back and they, they tussle each other? They were doing that. They were, like, <laughs> punching each other as they were walking down the road and jumping in each other's back. And I was like, God, I really have signed children this time, you know what I mean, you know? First time we went up to their office, there's Bobby Gillespie sat in the corner and Jim Reed coming down the stairs, and and you just sort of think this is a bit of a crazy world that we've suddenly landed in. The um, offices were above a sweatshop. It wasn't quite what you imagined it would be, but everybody, you know, it was really nice, and there was a nice kind of buzzy atmosphere in there. But we, we we definitely felt like the kids when we went in there. They were too young to even, you know, get them any drugs or anything. You know, it was like it was. It was the usual creation celebration around that time when we were still degenerates was champagne and cocaine and, 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 and ecstasy. And we, with them, I think it was like, I think we had a shandy or something. To suddenly say, we want you to become a part of that and for Alan McGee to be like so enthusiastic was just absolutely amazing. It gives you that confidence. You think, oh, you know, man, we can really go for this and, you know, try and make, you know, 
our stuff is good and we can get better. Adrian, our original drummer, said in the original meeting with Alan McGee that he was like, oh, I, I'm probably going to leave and go to university. And we were like, what? And at that point, we were like, oh, we're going to have to find another drummer. And we had seen the Charlottes playing somewhere, and we watched Simon, and we were just like, oh, my God, he's amazing. I want him. Slow Dive supported the Charlottes in... In 1990, and after the show, I was completely blown away. I just thought, this is my band. He just fitted right in, because he was like a massive fan of all the stuff we were into. I was kind of like, you know, this is like a dream come true. You know, great band, great label, we really stand a chance here. <laughs> At that point, we literally wrote from record to record. And so the next time we went in to record, I just picked on this studio in Sutton Courtney. It was such a weird thing. They appeared, there didn't seem to be any A&R involvement, and all my sort of classic business understandings was, where the fuck's the A&R guy? You know, they're just being allowed to do what the fuck they like, and it's, this is fucking brilliant. Courtyard Studios and Chris Hufford have been sort of the central point of the band's entire existence, really. Although he was just the engineer, he became kind of a part-time producer as well. It would be Chris and Neil that would sit there and throw ideas around. They were doing really out there stuff. Neil, in particular, his, his, his dreams, his aspirations were just bonkers. They kept wanting to break all the rules. When Neil was growing up, he wasn't really allowed to listen to pop music in his house. It was all classical music. Whatever he'd been listening to as a kid was coming out because it wasn't coming out in your standard cliché rock chords. That's for damn sure. experimented with. Many people use this sound to manifest the confusion that they saw in the world. <laughs> you know, AIDS, recession, yeah, Gulf yeah, War. Yeah, I did. These were heavy problems. They were. And they brought with them feelings of fear, anxiety, I was so insecurity. Fearful. And because many of these bands felt the weight of the world on their shoulders, they spent a good portion of their live gigs just staring at the floor. Yeah. And that is where the term shoegazer came from. I mean, apart from being quite shy and quite awkward, we just had these pedal boards, so we would spend a lot of time looking down because you're kind of tap dancing your way through the set a little bit, and, and that, that label then stuck. I prefer to think of it as progressive guitar music. <laughs> Every live gig, we seemed to get stronger as a unit. The crowds got bigger, the reviews got nicer. And then bang, there it is, England of the Week again, and you start thinking, right, we're sort of on a bit of a roll here. It's what everybody dreams about when you're playing air guitar or air drums in your bedroom. You want to be in a great band, you want to be liked, you want to see more and more people listening to you. So they, they were nice times. I think there was always an awareness that it wouldn't last very long, be just because that was the way the British music press operated at that point. 
There was definitely a, a short little brief period where the whole shoegazing Thames Valley scene could do no wrong. And I think when Just For The Day came out, there were people that really liked it, but it wasn't suddenly walk on water. Just For A Day came out and it got really bad reviews. I remember like reading the first reviews and just being like, oh God, no one likes the record. This is, this is a bit embarrassing. Unfortunately, Britain changed because the media at that point had a huge, huge say in what was cool and what wasn't cool. And Slow Dive had got more and more uncool. As soon as Nirvana started to break and everybody decided to kind of, you know, grow their hair and turn over from Seattle, that combined with the start of Britpop and, you know, it's very much like shoegaze was, was a term that nobody wanted to admit they liked. And I think it's very hard for people to kind of appreciate at this point just quite how, A, how much power they had and, and how, and how vicious they could be. You know, it was a culture of kind of building bands up and then being quite brutal about, about knocking it down again. All that stuff we did ignore for a while. We just thought, it's out of our control. You can write what you like. We're just gonna be over here doing our thing. We just felt like we were in a bubble floating around and people can try and kind of burst it, but, but it was get, getting very delicate at that point. The confidence of the band was pretty low at that point, um, partially as a result of the reception for the first album. Um, but also, you know, Neil and Rachel had been in a relationship. Um, you know, they, they did split up while the band was in this sort of phase. You know, it, was, it wasn't great, obviously, a bit messy, but I think we tried to keep that out of the band thing because it would be so easy for that to just destroy the band and I, you know and I think we all loved doing it so much it it was like you know you just kind of have to keep hanging on and and get through it it was a pretty heavy vibe personally and I think touring had been really hard for me and Rachel so and I think that had rubbed off on the band so I think you know where we'd all been like this big gang I think that had just started to fracture a little bit at that point and and I remember like spending a lot more time you know writing by myself The first stuff we recorded was was not really slow dive. I was being super influenced by like Joy Division and albums like Low and Lodger. Stuff that was slightly off what we were about. It was almost like we were looking around for music from when we were teenagers to try and get back that feeling of being in a band for the first time. So all those influences were coming out. And rather than looking forward, we were looking backwards. And, and I don't think the songs really worked out. I know that Creation weren't happy with them. We were called in to see Alan down into his office. See, you got no songs, they're all shit. And I'm like, OK, bugger. I wasn't being a con. I, I just genuinely didn't think they were good enough. It, was just, it just wasn't there, really. But anyway, I think we rejected about the first 25 songs that they gave me. Creation were coming up with some like ridiculous ideas around this time, like they were gonna like get other people in to try and write the songs and stuff. I remember like getting a really weird phone call from Alan, and he didn't want to talk about the songs, he wanted to talk about me getting some leather trousers, which was really confusing for me at that point. After 25 songs that I said shouldn't go on the record, I'd got fed up with it and went, do you know what? Just put on whatever you want. And I think we just gave the controls to, to Neil and went, you drive. I hope you get there. <laughs> Neil needs some space. He needs to kind of disappear and write some cool songs. Oh, man. 
manager at the time finally suggested he go and rent a cottage and just get away from everything. You know, he's quite old school, so I think he probably came from that school where it's just like, well, if, if the songwriter's having some, some issues, you know, his girlfriend's dumped him, let's just, <laughs> let's, let's mind that, you know, send him off to, send him off to a cottage somewhere and, and let him kind of stew for a while. And I was in North Wales somewhere in the middle of, middle of nowhere for like two weeks, just basically with a four, with a four track, just um, trying not to go outside too much. When he came back, he had a handful of songs that ended up on Souflaki. I remember he had Dagger. Um, I think he had Machine Gun, and I think he had 40 Days. Which were, you know, really good songs. I don't know what his frame of mind was like while he was there, but it definitely did help. It hadn't been long after Rachel and I had split up, so I was kind of miserable about that, and I was miserable about having to be in this little cottage in the middle of nowhere. And, and I think that informs the songs that came out of that. So suddenly he had something to write about. <laughs> You know, with 40 days, I think it was definitely, it was just about feeling miserable. It was, um, yeah, it's a breakup song. <laughs> They're very loose drums. It kind of bounced a bit more, it skipped, and that's kind of a new thing to the slow dive sound. We were looking for a, 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 a more sparkly, and in some ways poppier feel to, to certain aspects of it. We didn't want to make an entire pop record, but we wanted to have more light and shade and, and, more, and more sort of feel to it. Which gave Neil and Rachel a bit more freedom and Christian as well with his guitars to sort of play around with the sound in, in a new way. <laughs> Of the slow dive stuff was it was about atmospheres and so possibly in a sort of slightly teenagey sort of way it was about creating like these cinematic moments I suppose so, so I guess the, the lyrics would kind of try and lock into that a little bit <laughs> It's like you can watch a film and it can remind you of really sweet moments and you kind of lock into that as a feeling and I think that sometimes that, that sort of stuff can carry over into songs as well. When the Sun Hits was, uh, is one of my kind of all-time favourites. I always consider it to be quite a happy song, really, quite uplifting. I liked the song because it was this kind of blaze of light, you know, and the lyrics and the music kind of suit each other. I loved it when, when he brought it into the studio and we started to work it out. I could feel it was a really, really big song. And it's a really fun one to play live. 
It's incredibly popular live. It's like, right, well, it's when the sun hits now, so let's crank it up a notch, you know. For me, it was always like the Pixies song, you know, because it has that quiet, loud thing. You know, I wanted a kind of a Pixies bass line in there because, you know, I, lo I still love Kim Deal's bass lines. I think she's you know, one of the best players. So we wanted to, uh, we wanted to have that kind of, that kind of feel. I remember McGee like phoning me up when he heard that song. He was like, he was concerned that I might be, um, you know, on heroin because he's like, "Hey, you're talking about when the sun hits, man. Surely, <laughs> surely." I was like, "Alan, I'm not going to wear any leather trousers, and I'm not taking any heroin just yet. It's all good." We then gave Creation the next batch of recordings, and they were like, well, maybe you guys should think about getting a producer, because that didn't sound too good. We all struggled with making things sound bright, you know. We always ended up with a bit of a mush sometimes. The traditional slow dive method of mixing was just to put all the faders at 11, and to just have a wall of noise, and that obviously didn't sound too good. We wanted somebody who was going to give a fresh um, sound to what we what we were trying to do to, to brighten things up. A lot of the bands that I was working with before I worked with them were a bit murkier, and so I just had this reputation of cleaning it up a little bit and making it a little bit more radio friendly. He had a completely impartial ear. You know, when you've been recording for a long time, you can get in a muddle. You can get too close to something, and that was exactly the reason why we gave it to him. They spent a long time on this record. And there was lots and lots and lots and lots of layers. And one of the first things I did was get rid of a whole chunk of stuff. I remember us all sitting there going, this isn't right. Where's it, where have all the guitars gone? <laughs> and then at a certain point, I think like, the penny dropped with all of us that actually this might make it listenable. It's difficult with that sort of music because you're trying to keep the poppiness intact, but you don't want to get rid of that orchestral vagueness. So it's just being able to keep the, both things sort of present at the same time. Neil was quite heavily influenced by Eno's work that he did with David Bowie on the three albums that were recorded in Berlin. So, you know, he was kind of a bit of a, a bit of a kind of production hero. We were really in, interested in getting him involved. I think he was coming off the back of U2 and stuff like that. He just sounded like logically an intelligent move. So I asked Brian Eno and Brian Eno went, yeah. Said he wasn't really interested in producing, but he would do some like co-writing with us over two or three days. And then, you know, Neil was the only one that met him in the end, which was kind of unfortunate for the rest of us, getting really excited. And then you're like, no, you're not going to meet him. Like, oh. But yeah, for some reason, I got thrown into a studio with, with Eno. And this is slightly embarrassing, but I wasn't really aware of what he'd done at that point. I knew that he'd worked with David Bowie. And so, and so when, I, when, when I met him, I remember like talking to him an awful lot about David Bowie because I thought that was what he was famous for. And I wasn't aware of his solo records. I had no idea that like, he was like the godfather of ambient at that point at all. You know, he'd, he'd taken like a clock off the wall 
and he put that by the desk and that was that was like his method of working I guess for, for that particular session was to just divide everything up into like 10 minute slots and I would just go I would go into this room play the guitar he'd record me for 10 minutes and then he'd tell me to play something else for 10 minutes it was literally like that so we'd record like hours of the stuff and Neil would have to be like right okay it's Brian Eno's out there he wants me to play this guitar and you know he didn't necessarily have any ideas about what he was going to play the fact that i didn't really know much about him was kind of quite good because i think if i had i'd have just been too awestruck to really be confident enough to go into a room and start playing the guitar in any kind of way that would have been free or or easy <laughs> Going back with these tapes, it was sort of repetitive motif, sound texture based, beautiful and a nightmare for me because I sat down and none of it had been done to a click track. So the timings, I literally had to score the drumming parts and the, I had these paper everywhere trying to play, sing, speeding up, slowing down slightly, you know, and it took for ages. I mean, the, the drums are kind of completely different to anything else we'd, we'd done before. Because it almost has like a trip hop kind of quality to it, um, which wasn't really where we were at at all. And actually might have been before trip hop anyway. My concern was he's going to be very, very hands on. In fact, not true at all. I think one of Eno's strengths was that he'd come in and act as a catalyst and also get other people to do more work and then he'd depart. Neil started to become more prolific and write these really fantastic songs. We thought we'll try Chris Hufford again because we'd spent really six months just thinking, yeah, let's try this one, let's record that one. This is quite a cool song. It was very fragmented. There wasn't a sort of band vibe there. It wasn't until we went back to Courtyard again that things started to fall into place a little bit. <laughs> great to have them back again you know there was a, there was a di direction a new direction like I was really starting to get into stuff like Aphex Twin and, and get more interested in kind of dub music and like early sort of drum and bass kind of stuff so he was kind of pushing it in that direction the Eno kind of collaboration that had inspired us so we thought you know let's really space it out It was a track that came together as a band, just basically around that sort of bouncing guitar riff. And I had an idea for a melody which I'd sung over the top to Rachel when we were in the studio, and then she went in and sang it and wrote some lyrics for it. Him and Rachel had completely unravelled. You know, they were both hurting and she had stuff to write about. I think there's definitely Rachel's song about Neil, because she wrote the words for that one. It just came out of my mouth. Yeah, it's not a very happy song, really. Uh, I, I've no idea what she says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they're lovely. We kind of gone back to the traditional way of working with that one, just in the studio, creating it as we were recording it. And I remember looking at Rachel and Rachel up, and looking at Christian and Nick, and us all looking at one another like, this is sounding amazing. And there was a feeling amongst us that we kind of got the band vibe back again. 
And even though Neil and Rachel had, had split up, it, it very much felt like slow dive again. We wanted to mix it live, you know, so you add the delays as you're mixing it. Neil, myself and Chris Hufford were all on the Neve desk at Courtyard. The drums are going through this DD2. Everybody's got their hands on faders. I remember all of us being very jolly and uh, Simon sort of dancing and tweaking there. Bob's on the desk and like moving phases. There was just so much fucking delay going on everywhere and it wasn't an automated desk, so there was lots of rubbish having to be done all the time to actually work your way through this thing. We literally probably did about 20 straight through takes where we would play the track and mix it down. It was real old school stuff on that front. I'm kind of fuck. Who fucked up that time? Let's go another rehearsal. Just never put you on the clock. You just sit there and be continually just rolling. Really small little joints. Do you know? It's a little single skinner. The hashish helps me from being a grumpy old man. I was really stoned. But I mean, you know, Nick and Christian didn't do any drugs at all, actually. So they were always the straight ones. I guess you know, it kind of lends itself uh, on some levels to more creativity. It depends, really, doesn't it? With Souflaki, it definitely was a good thing, but you know, Nick did that bass line, no drum. So what does that say? Dagger came out of that writing session in Wales. That was the atmosphere of that cottage in Wales. It wasn't a happy place. The sunshine girl is sleeping. She falls and dreams alone. I don't think listening to any of the songs or playing the songs, I kind of felt like there was an uncomfortable this is like Neil's diary or Rachel's diary, um, apart from Dagger. It's definitely about a, a slightly fucked up relationship, which I think is what Rachel and I had at the end there. <laughs> the first time I heard Dagger was quite sad, actually, like, sort of for obvious reasons. That's it's quite a sad song, and I couldn't listen to it for a really long time, probably for years, to be honest. The world is full of noise, yeah. Like, personally, I always felt, oh, it's a very kind of vulnerable, kind of exposing track, you know, so I've always been... I was always uncomfortable with it in that respect. It's kind of a strange thing, you know, you're playing in a band with this couple that have just split up. And, I mean, obviously, because we travelled around, we toured together, you're in the same bus, you're in the same hotel, eat breakfast, lunch and dinner together, and so you're very much... You feel every sort of... Everything that happens between a couple. Obviously, at the time, it was it was really hard to sort of get on a tour bus and to be that close to someone that you, you've been in love with and that you're like now having a very hard time to sort of just, you know because it's you know as as everyone knows when those sort of things the, the thing you want to do is kind of spend some time apart. So you, so we didn't really have the option. She whispers while I'm sleeping. Lost it for a while. 
it was a little bit different to anything we'd done previously, which I think is what um, we all liked about it. It's weird because it's such a traditional song, but that really pushed us as a band. You know, the idea of doing an acoustic song was, was a real kind of like, whoa, steady. <laughs> we don't do that stuff. <laughs> um, but, but I guess that's just, you know, from because of where, where we were coming from was it was from a completely different place. So it really stands out on, on the record. On the album, it took a year to do almost. And at the end, we went to First Protocol in London. And Neil was, again, on his own writing tracks, but really inspired. Um, he shaved off all his hair. He turned up to the studio with, like, no hair. Yeah, I remember just seeing Neil coming up the stairs to the studio, and he'd, like, just completely shaved his head. Not quite sure what, what he was doing around then. It was basically a bad acid experience. And I, yeah, I ended up with, with a shaved head, which freaked everyone out, including myself, for a while. He was going through a few changes, and it really kind of inspired the tracks. And the, I think the last song he wrote was Alison, and when he came in with that, it was like, that's going straight on the album, that's it, done. <laughs> kind of overt sort of pop moment, I suppose. But I don't remember sitting down and trying to write, write a pop song, really. We recorded it, and um, it just sounded like a, a jangly indie pop song. And um, we got to remixing with Ed Buller, and he completely turned it around. I mean, he just arranged it in such a way that, uh, that suddenly here was this great pop song. You know, um, the lyrics were good, and um, yeah, I just thought it should be poppy. We had already split up, and he he was with somebody else anyway. Um, I was with somebody else. Yeah, it's kind of difficult with lyrics, isn't it? Because you tend to listen and think, oh, I wonder if that's about la 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 la. I started going out with someone else, um, and we were we were living together with a couple of other people, and. Um, it was kind of inspired a little bit by, by that household, I suppose, like Michelle and her friend Alison. And I think it was quite an optimistic song because I think for me it was it sort of come out of come out of a long relationship with Rachel and things have, you know, things have been a bit negative for a while, I suppose, and I think that, that, that it, was, it was an optimistic song about being in love with someone and sort of being open to new things again, you know? So I, I kind of always see the song in, in, in that way, although I guess lyrically it's not always optimistic in that song, but, but for me it was, it was a kind of a song of, it was a song that was as much about the future as it was about, you know, the past, I suppose. I remember thinking we've got a really good album here and quite excited about it, you know, and it felt like a proper full band record. It was a huge relief to actually get it kind of done and sequenced and I probably just thought this will do. I mean, personally, I thought it was a great record. I thought I was really pleased with Souflaki. Surely somebody's going to like it. And they all hated it. Oh, yeah, here we go. 
again. We're just going to slate it. They're not actually going to listen. By that point, I think whatever we'd have put out was going to be criticised. You know, in the UK, just the Britpop thing was starting to happen. So, you, you know, certainly it was all about suede and all that, and we didn't, we didn't fit in with that at all. That became kind of the norm and the lad culture with the kind of Union Jacks and football and lager and the loaded magazine, you know, the jock culture, maybe you'd call it in America, it all came to the fore. Suddenly there was like these guys with long fringes and stripy t-shirts, nah, we want football booze and boobs. <laughs> going into creation. McGee not being there, just looking around, not recognising a lot of people and just thinking, pretty much everyone in this room is disinterested in us as a band. Oh, shit. But I liked Sivlaki. I mean, we, we picked up the option and made Pygmalion. Do you know what I mean? So it's a bit like, you know, we weren't, we weren't idiots about it. We, we, we knew they were a good band, but it, it didn't really fit where we were going well as a label because we'd, we'd get into kind of like, being a big time record label because we had Oasis. We kind of saw suddenly, fuck, we're going to be huge. We want that one. Do you know what I mean? So everything else that wasn't going to make us huge kind of got sidelined, if we were being honest. Two of Britain's most popular pop groups have begun the biggest chart war in 30 years. Working class men from Manchester called Oasis. I felt like really kind of our moment had passed sort of thing. I think Nick joked that they should put the, like, the sales sticker on the actual album cover, you know? Because <laughs> we just felt like that was it, you know? No one was going to remember us at all. And at that point, people stopped turning up to our concerts. And the last London show we played was December 1993 at the garage. It holds about 700 people, and we struggled to get 300. You know, as we finished the set, I remember looking up and there was a woman mopping the floor where the audience should be, and I remember thinking, you know, maybe I need to kind of get a real job. The world never got slow dive, uh, if we were being honest, really honest about it all. You know, I got it, but it's really difficult to do something when nobody else cares. We had our own universe going. We just thought, fuck them. We'll do our own thing. We're good enough. And eventually, the, the, it, it, it dissolved, but um, it didn't disappear. Ultimately, what you want in a band is for your records to stand the test of time, you know, and for people to still listen to them or to discover things, you know. And 20 years later, people still are, which is amazing. You know, I don't feel like I'm playing songs that are 20 years old. I mean, I kind of, sometimes when I'm doing the lyrics, I'm like, wow, you were pretty young, you know, and, I can, and it kind of all comes back. My game, don't lose me. Come so far, don't lose me. Despite the kind of dark times that he had and Rachel had when they broke up, I think all those things kind of came together to make Souflaki a strong record because we were pushed as a band to make a much better record. It was just a case of quite a young band, like coming out of that initial kind of period where you're excited about your influences and you're making this kind of quite spontaneous music where you've not really thought about it. And then all of a sudden you're put in this position where you're like, okay, you need to actually think about it. And I guess our way to do that was to kind of dig really deep, you know, going through a few different styles, you know, hooking up with someone like Eno to just see if we could find something that, that worked for us. It certainly wasn't an easy record for us to make. You know, it was definitely, it, it, yeah, it was by, by far the hardest one. They always did what they wanted to do. You know, that's, that was one of the key things I learned, learned from them. You know, when you do something original, it can come around again. 
now after the event, people get slow dive 20 years later. I'm glad, I'm glad that the good guys sometimes win. And uh, you know, they've won finally. Uh -huh.